Good morning. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen around the world, and good morning, Graham. It's lovely to see you today. Um, I am excited about today because today is the first time we're doing our precursor to our Ignite Mastermind sessions. So this is a new exciting concept where we are discussing one particular topic and, and, and drawing it out in depth and then opening it up in the next uh, session to whoever the premium members are that want to join in and discuss and ask questions. Generally, there will be a third person in this, and that will be our, our featured expert. But as this is our first, and I know that Graham is an expert on everything, and he will tell you himself he's an expert on everything, that, <laughs> that he... <laughs> That he will, um, that we will just talk about this. Now, the topic for today is creating a successful art practice. What are the foundations of an art practice? You want to be an art superstar. You want to make money. You want to make a business out of your art. And what does that mean? So there's a few topics, a few points that we, Graham and I have discussed in advance that we're going to, to eke out in this conversation. Um, but first of all, I'm going to hand you over to Graham and he's going to talk about the first, first basic things about the foundations of good art practice and what that means. Right. Well, thank you, Nat. Um, there's, a, there's a number of things involved and I've seen people over the years be very successful and others that have worked really hard that have got great artwork but just are not successful enough uh, or can't find success. And I suppose it depends on how you quantify success as well, what does it actually mean? Does it mean that you can do what you love doing? Does it mean that you have a huge bank account? Um, you know, it's the choices that I think that you're able to make that make you successful. You don't necessarily have to be a millionaire by any means, but I think that if you can pursue your passion and the thing that you love most of all in life, I think that in itself is success. And then to be able to uh, pay it forward or pay it back uh, and influence others and help them with uh, with their choices as well is, is part of success also. But I think that, I mean, I've, I've made uh, just about every mistake you can possibly make um, in business and in my art. I mean, <laughs> up, down, bloody nose, I mean, anything you can think of, that's like I've, I've fallen over every direction. And, and in saying that, you probably potentially still do. There's a lot of things that you learn the like love that you don't need in your life, not what you do need in your life. Um, but I think part and parcel of getting started with, uh, with any, any practice or anything you do is to do exactly that, pra practice. Um, and it's no point, uh, I mean, the, the, the thing about art, art is, is that most artists aren't very business savvy under any circumstances. They have a passion for what they want to do. And they're extraordinarily focused on that, which is, you know, 95% of, of creating in the first place is to dedicate yourself to that passion. But a lot of them let themselves down on the, the side of maintaining and managing the business side of what they do. Um, you know, I have a lot of people approach me all the time about getting originals or prints and, you know, will you donate this, that, will you donate that, that. And sort of like after a while you go, well, hang on, does anybody really appreciate what I do? It's getting to the stage where you look at your practice as though you were a doctor or you were a lawyer or you were a mechanic. And you know, if people are going to come to you, this is your business. So if you don't conduct it in that manner, you, you won't be appreciated for the ability, the ability that you have in the first place. So I think that's the, that's the key factor is to be true to yourself. Be true to yourself and then true to your business practice as far as art is concerned. In starting that, I mean, compared to when I did, I mean, that was 35 years ago, it's changed quite dramatically in the sense that, you know, we, we filmed Eric Rhodes last year, who's one of the top art promoters in the United States. And since the advent of the internet, things have changed quite dramatically across the world. I mean, in the old days, you would have a gallery and an agent and a manager. And if you got to those high standards of, of, of exhibiting your work, uh, you were very lucky. 95% of artists don't have that. 
But these days with the amount of information and the information that we're supplying and so does the other companies that we work with, Auspicious for a start, um, obviously Streamline Publications with Eric Rhodes, Carol and uh, Edland that we're working with with Artsy Shark. All of those people are, are practised art entrepreneurs. You know, and I always say to people, it was like when I did Colour in Your Life, don't reinvent the wheel, just recolour it to suit you what, what you want it to be. And there's always formulas for success in everything. I think the thing that people don't do is they don't discipline themselves to have a continuum to actually put all of those things in place to make sure that those, those steps are, are there. And, you know, uh, artistic people, very right brains, they don't think analytically by any means, but your, your practice is going to be successful on that, that proviso. So there'll be a number of things that we, we will discuss as, as we go along and, um, uh, and that's just sort of part and parcel of the introduction. But there's, a, there's a number of topics that we can talk about in this that we can elaborate for people on what they, what they need to do and what they don't do as well because there's a whole bunch of don'ts involved in this and um, one of those don'ts is um, don't give your work to somebody that you don't know and don't do anything without a contract. You know, don't give painting somewhere without um, with an consignment notes. You know, there's all the notes that go into it as well, not just the do's. Great. So that's a really good start. So let's first start about the emotions of art. Um, as, a, as an amateur artist myself, I know that every time I make a, a mark on that paper, whether it's pencil, charcoal, watercolour, I have this thing on my shoulder going, you're not good enough. That's, that, that is crap. I can't believe you just put a green there. You should have put a blue there. And, and I second guess every, every mark I make. And I think that's a really big part of being an artist is able to acknowledge that critic I call it my monkey on my shoulder, uh, on acknowledge it and say, yeah, okay, whatever, and just continue continue going because, as, as you know, Graham, and, and many artists know that it takes more than just five minutes or half an hour to create a piece. You have to be able to have the confidence and the, the, be able to deal with that inner critic for a long, extended period of time. And then when the piece is finished, you have to then you know, brace yourself for the actual social critics, for the audience, and, and, and what if they don't like it? And, and, and so how do you, you know, what do you think about that kind of, how do you manage the emotions of the art process, Graham? You're probably asking the wrong guy about that sort of thing because <laughs> I, can, I can be reasonably emotionless sometimes when it comes to that. You know, and I've had to. I mean, you're not just a, a critic towards yourself, but, you know, there's, I'm not looking for the 99% of the people in the world to accept who I am or what I do. If I can find the 1% that appreciates my ability and, and the fact that they want to invest or purchase my work, they're the ones I'm looking for. So I really don't care what people think at all. And I think that that, that involved as far as arts is concerned is you've, you've got to sort of um, grow some watermelons sometimes and say to yourself, it, it really doesn't matter. You know, I'm not doing this for anybody else anyway and I don't care what they think. You know, and that's, that's part and parcel of that success process as well, you know, because people take a lot of that on board and then... It's the other people that say that you can't are the ones that generally can't do it themselves. Mm. You know, it's like even when, we, when I started Colour Your Life, everybody said you can't do that. And it's like, well, why not? It's because they can't do it. You know, and have you ever seen a statue erected to a critic anywhere? <laughs> <laughs> they, don't, they don't exist. So the, 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 nays, the naysayers are people that generally can't do anything themselves and they haven't had the intestinal fortitude to change their own lives. So uh, there are emotions involved. I mean, if you look at somebody like, say, Picasso, and there's always that criticism uh, within yourself about, oh, is it good enough? Am I, am I doing the right thing? And then Picasso was a fantastic draftsman when he first started his career as a young man. He could just pretty well draw anything. But then again, at the age of 93, when he passed away, he was, the, he was the greatest abstract artist in the world. And it's even the same with my own work. There, there's no finished result. 
this is this is doing this because you love doing it admittedly but you don't want to go out and you don't want to dig holes and you don't want to be a doctor and you don't want to do something else you want to be an artist so what what is the process of of making sure that you make a living out of that at the same time i mean how are you going to do that and i and i think that process as far as the emotion is concerned is it's about you're perfectly entitled to reinvent yourself any day you choose to do so that's one of the beauties about being an artist is you can just go you know what at the age of nearly 60 my eyes aren't what they used to be so i've gone in the last 35 years from painting very very super realistic pictures of animals and i still love doing animals and and love painting the female form and the whole thing but if you look at my work from start to finish now i mean it's 180 degrees you know if i'm lucky enough to get to 90 it'll be all gone 360 degrees away from where i actually started i just get up every day with the knowledge that i can do what i love to do i mean that's that's the reward that's sort of like success again yeah. it's like i can make those choices 99.9 .9 of the people in the world simply can't do that i mean half the world is just busy trying to put food in their mouth yeah. let alone doing what we do yeah. so I, I think I think the, the emotion is you have to have control over that. Yeah, I'm an emotional man. I'll sit down and cry in a movie, but I don't let it get the best of me. I, I look at it realistically, if you know what I mean, and I say two and two equals four. It doesn't equal 3.78, no matter what somebody says. And then you, you have to take that practical application and put it into your business and into your emotions and say, look, if I'm going to change in five years, I'll change. You know what? Miriam Parr, who's the young lass who paints with a, with a mouth in the United States, who's a friend of mine. Miriam got shot in the neck when she was 20 years of age and she loved to paint. She's in a quadriplegic in a wheelchair. But that didn't stop her by any means. She's still completing her mission. She's still successful. Even though somebody took that away from her, she's still a successful woman because she pursued her passion. And that's the difference. That's the emotion that I see in it anyway. So, so then there's the other part, or another part, because there's many parts, is how you organise it all. Um, so one, one of the foundations I think of a good art practice is your studio and getting yourself set up so that it's organised. So whether that is a, for me, it's a trolley, uh, or if I'm going plein air, it's a backpack. And I have, um, and everything I need is in that backpack and it's organised. It's not half done. Many people, have, and I've seen the most extraordinarily beautiful studios and warehouses uh, where people have their studios. But if you don't have your, your studio or your place organised and it's all about commitment. This is, this is where I'm going to do my artwork today. This is the time I'm going to give to it. And, and being a committed artist is having a, a studio that's relatively organised. You know your paint is over there. You know your sculpture tools are there. You know your paper's there. And, you know, and, and I think that that is a really vital part. I've, I've put together a whole lot of pictures of different studios I liked on our Pinterest board, um, on the Colouring Your Life Pinterest board studios. Mm -hmm. but there's... It doesn't have to be a studio. It has to be, it can be a backpack or a trolley, as, as I said. And, and you, Graham, when I've been to your place, you have your whole lounge room as your, your studio. Um, and, and do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, it just depends on where you are. I mean, I've had, you know, I sort of think when you can become a successful artist, you, you employ a whole bunch of really talented women like you. <laughs> and that helps me just to continue to do what I need to do for a start. So I'm surrounded by a whole bunch of other people that make really good decisions for me. <laughs> so it's like, oh, okay. But, um, but because of, because of colour in your life and because um, I have been moving around the world so much and going from location to location, I don't have the studio space that I normally would have. Um, uh, I'm in the process of changing that in the next hopefully 12 months. But I, I agree with what you're saying as far as being organised within the studio. I, I, I remember when I was a young artist, so it was about 25 years ago, I went and saw a gentleman and I became friends with him called Raymond Ching, 
and he lived in uh, Stratford on Avon, Stratford upon Avon. And he's one of the leading wildlife artists, portrait artists in the world. I mean, Raymond gets a half a million dollars of painting, half a million pounds of painting. So he's an extremely successful man. And I walked into his studio. And I think that you can, and and I've been really lucky to walk into over 200 studios in the last seven years and see what people are doing. And you can see the successful artists have got really good dynamic studios. They've got plenty of supplies in there. Not everybody can afford to do that. But they set themselves up in a in a in a shed, or somewhere, or in a building like um, Joe's Vulvic for a start. He's the world's leading watercolor artist. I mean, you walk into his studio, and it's like walking into a Harry Potter scene. It's like old propellers and bric-a-brac all over the walls, and old lamps and photos from France and a beret hanging on this. And it's just a fantastic place to be. And it's a place where he's got a library within there, and it's just the studio. Not everybody can afford to do that by any means. But it is important to have things organised within that system. And once again, artists tend not to be like that. Um, and in saying that, when I go and film artists, I don't want them to clean up the studios either, which a lot of them do do. It's like, no, 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 leave it. So, so I, I think in whatever you're doing, if you're painting big paintings and they're like 10 feet by 10 feet, you're obviously going to need a fairly large studio space to do that. And there are a lot of um, cooperatives around as well. Now, you're talking about the Moreland Bar Arts Trail and uh, obviously Moreland Bar Arts, which is one of the huge warehouses that we've got down in Moreland Bar that has studios that are built into that and plenty and plenty of space for people to move. If you don't have it at your home, remember it's still your business. You can always write this off on your tax anyway, but you do need a place. I mean, I'm lucky enough to be able to have an office and a studio in the same place but it is important for you to feel like you're a practising artist, like you do have a place for you to go to. Mm -hmm. Your passion is your business. So, 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 find another two or three or four people that can get into an area that if there's somebody always there in a sense. And and it's not a nine-to-five job. This is not a nine-to-five job. I mean, I work till 12 o'clock at night and I'll be up at 6 o'clock in the morning conducting business for most of the day, and then I'll go to the studio and start to work. So there inherently is a lot of discipline involved in that, and the companies that I work with now that are expecting me to perform, whether I'm illustrating a book, or I'm putting an exhibition together, or I'm doing licensing for somebody overseas, is that your, your part and parcel of their business structure, and they want you, and that's the reason they'll choose you over somebody else. They'll look at everything that you've done, your portfolio, your studio, how you've organised it, how you organise your business. Because then those people, those clients, those investors, those businesses are going to go, I'm not going to be wasting my time with this person. If I commission them to do something or if I ask them to do something, they get a show together within a certain period of time, I will work with them. And those are the artists that become successful, not the ones that drag all the emotion in going, oh, I'm having such a bad day. You know, in the end, nobody really cares. You know, they look at it as though it's going to be a business, whether you like it or not. So speaking of the business side of art, that in itself is a whole new ball game. There's so many things to consider within the business of art from uh, what name you're going to call yourself to how you're going to talk about yourself to the website you're going to put up to whether you use social media or whether you sell online, whether you use the Colour in Your Life store to sell your work, um, how you approach galleries, and and that it's a whole big ball game. But it's really important in creating a, a successful art practice that you think about it. Whether you do you want to make your art your business, or are you just doing it for play? Like I just do it for play, and and that's fine. But people like Graham do it as part of their business and it's an integral part and getting that right is something that Calor in Your Life can support you with. So next month for our premium members, we're going to be sending out a arts marketing business checklist just to ensure that you, you know, have got everything in place to to make sure that you have a successful art practice. Um, I've spent years coaching artists on how to make a successful art practice and, and Graham has spent years 
creating a successful art practice. I, I, I know several people who have got successful art practices. Um, but what do you have to say about that, Graham? How, uh, with the business of art, uh, what are some quick tips that you can uh, had, add to this conversation? Uh, well, firstly, to be disciplined. Um, next, to be organised on both sides of what you do. And what, what are you trying to say? I mean, there's obviously the, um, the passion that you have for creativity in the first place, and generally artists are trying to say something within their work, unless they're just like a plain landscape artist or, you know, but there's still an emotion in there. And it's how do you brand yourself? I mean, in today's market, in comparison to, say, 100 years ago, people would just paint, let an agent do it. But today, with the marketing and the internet, social networking, it's how do you brand yourself as an identity? I mean, colour in your life is very much a part and parcel of, of what I do, and people recognise that, and it's sort of probably accelerated my career a little bit more and enabled me to obviously sell a lot more work because of that. But then again, there was a lot more effort involved in putting that together, and I can guarantee that most people won't do that. But how do you, how do you brand yourself uh, as a man or a woman? And, and, and what makes you stand out in the marketplace? Um, you know, video, and we get a, approached a lot by varying companies online or TV stations that, that want to take the show these days. And we have a number of artists that come on board as part of their marketing process or, or putting their marketing together. Because what Colour in Your Life does is it enables people to brand themselves. It enables them to tell their story, which is part and parcel of what you're trying to do within your business. It's branding and telling that story. If it's just a circle with a dot in the middle of it, it's like, okay, but if people know why the circle's there and there's the dot in the middle, they can understand that. That's part of your branding. It's part of your marketing as well. As well as a lot of other people that I've, I've noticed that are being successful on the net um, are actually producing a lot of their own content and even a lot of the colour in your life artists are doing that now themselves. So once they did the show, the, the light bulb sort of twigged for them and went, oh, hang on, this is how I can build a much greater business for myself. There is an inherent amount of fear involved in, in doing this. You know, I speak to a lot of people that come to me and they go, what, so what do I do? And I go, well, if you do that, 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 and then you get yourself a decent camera and then you set yourself up so that you can be conveying your story and your brand on a continuous basis and then manage your, your YouTube or Vimeo or your Daily Motion site. They go, oh, that's a great idea, but I know I wouldn't do that. And it's like, well, okay. <laughs> it's like we've just told you what you need to do. <laughs> it's like how do I become successful? You know, what are the best stock picks? I, oh, well, I wouldn't spend that money. So, so like, oh, okay, so you won't spend the money to obviously get the best stocks because the guy knows what he's talking about. Mm. Yeah, it's a great idea, but I wouldn't do it. Mm. So they just stand there and they're frustrated. I know that you've come across them as well. I meet them virtually every single week. Mm. And I go, you're doing exactly the opposite of what successful people are telling you to do. Mm. And you're in the same place and you're complaining about it. And so it's, you know, sometimes an artist can simply be their own worst enemy. I mean, literally. And I think that the internet, I mean, the reason Google bought YouTube is that video is king. It is king now. I mean, if you do not have video content somewhere within your system, your backlinks and your meta tags just basically fall to the ground. They really do. So, it, it, you know, you can't emphasize how important it is these days. And the internet's only 15% of what's going to get to. I mean, literally in the next 20 years, the, the, the speeds that we'll get, the information transfer, and the people you'll be able to get in touch with, will be massively bigger than it is now. If you're not in it, you're wasting your time as far as your marketing is concerned because you're, all you're doing then is doing it in the old-fashioned way. I guarantee it. I mean, you know, people are trying to get the same results. You know, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. Mm. Yeah. You know, so what do you do? You know what? You can leave the horse to the water, <laughs> but you can't make a drink. Yeah, that's, that's very true. So if we leave arts marketing and art business aside, we talk about record keeping. So for me, record mm -hmm. keeping with, for me and my personal art practice, I like to collect pictures of things that I want to paint. And I want to, and generally 
it's often I take photographs or I look at art magazines and I take photographs or I, I flip through Pinterest boards and I take photo and I save them. So my best way of keeping records um, of things that I want to draw or things that inspire me are on Pinterest. And I know I'm, I'm probably a big fan on Pinterest because it's the easiest way of saving things online. Um, you just, you just pin, you find something online and you pin it to a particular board. I've got a watercolour techniques board. I have a, a board about orange. Um, and, and, I mean, that's, that's a, a contemporary way of keeping records. And you don't have to do it that way. Other ways are the beautiful art journals where as you go, you collect bus tickets and postcards and, and you do quick drawings of particular places. But... You, you can't expect yourself just to sit down and create and draw something just like that. You need to, well, I think you need to have um, a whole lot of inspiration around you. You need to have collected things together to inspire you so that you're not sitting down to a blank sheet or a blank canvas with nothing um, to back you up. You're there with a lot of ideas and that's what record keeping is, including uh, so as well as if you are doing your art of the business, you need to keep photographs and digital photographs of your artwork. I, I know that speaking to the featured artists on Colour in Your Life, many of them don't keep digital photos of your artwork. So they have to go quickly before they do the show and take dozens of images of their artwork. It's, it's, um, it's really vitally important to keep... Uh, images and records leading up to the art process and then post art process and even during the art process so that you can yeah. promote how you do the artwork. Isn't, what do you think about that, Graham? Yeah. yeah, obviously there's two sides to the story. I think your, as far as your record self keeping for your creativity is that, yeah, I do the same thing. I mean, some people might just decide to paint a landscape and do it in plain air and pictures in front of you. So you don't necessarily need to keep a lot of that information. But if you're putting together some of the complex pieces that I put together on occasions, there's a lot of research that goes into them. You know, sometimes it like, takes me six or seven months to paint one of those big paintings. It take me three months to do the research on it. You know, so those, and, you know, sometimes my studio looks like a criminal police office board. I mean, there's stuff stuck all over the joint, and I do word association, so I'm writing on the on the charts as well, sort of like, yeah, write that, and I'll put that there. So the whole thing is just a story that you make up, and it becomes it becomes a visual then, and you start to map it together as you see the words and, and the pictures. But I think that the more important side, as you were saying, is that I've been doing this for 35 years. Um, you know, unfortunately, I've had some transparency stolen in the past. And then, but I always kept those records virtually going back to the, the year I started my career and keeping those digital records. A lot of artists will take a, like a terrible little photo and they'll stick it in a horrible little album with sort of faded yellow plastic in there and tattered edges on an old photo album and I'll just sort of go up to a gallery director like Oliver Twist and you know, <laughs> look at my work and it's like, guys, you just can't do that. If you expect it to be taken seriously, you might be a really talented person that you've, you've got to act professionally in what you do. And part of that is to keep keep those records and maintain those records. The thing that a lot of artists don't understand is apart from maybe doing a retrospective or doing a book later on, and I've got a couple of books out on my work as well, is that the, the, the image itself, as far as the business is concerned about, is potentially worth a lot more than the actual painting itself. I mean, you might sell a painting for five or $10,000, and it could be a really fantastic image. Um, not everybody can afford a ten thousand dollar painting, but they may be able to afford a four or five hundred dollar reproduction. Um, you know, I've sold a number of reproductions in the last couple of weeks to varying companies, people all over the joint, and it's by keeping those digital records, good, good, solid, whether they had been transparencies at one stage, which which really aren't used anymore these days, but having a good camera, you know, a good camera with high megapixels on it, and being able to to capture that. And we'll even go into that at some stage and we'll talk about how to take a good photograph without paying $100 or $50 to a photographer in a studio to do that. I mean, there are ways to do it and we can talk about using Photoshop in conjunction 
so that you get the best quality out of the final product that you use. I mean, I never just take the photo and then just crop it and then throw it into the system. I take it into Photoshop and I'll look at it and I'll readjust the colors and the contrast and the hues and the layers and I'll go, that looks good too. So that's another thing that we can chat about later on. But I think that those records are far more important because the end result is that that's part of your business practice. Is, is sort of saying, I can't afford $5,000. Can you afford 500? Yeah, I really like the image. Okay, well, I'll print one off for you. You can have one of 99, one of 299. So, you know, straight away, you've got another market. Then there's the licensing side of it, which is what I do as well. And somebody will take an image and they could take, take that to 50 or 60 companies. And they might sort of say, we want to produce prints of that. We want to put, you know, that into postcards or something. I mean, there's a myriad of different things that you can do, depending on your artwork. Not everybody wants to have their artwork on, you know, a calendar. Um, but then again, you go to a Picasso or a Van Gogh or a Rembrandt exhibition anywhere in the world, and guess what's in the foyer? Yeah. Mugs and cards and placemats and anything you can think of. So, you know, the world, world of, you know, the commercial world finally caught up with the art world. That's right. That's right. Merchandising is another whole conversation about how you make money from your art. The final thing I want yeah. to uh, just raise in this is we've talked a lot about, um, you know, making the art and, and uh, what you do with leading up to it. But what about you know, the actual literal foundations of it? Um, I know, uh, you know, I've been painting from since high school and I still am learning that there are foundations of art that I didn't even know about. Um, so for me, for me to develop my own art practice, um, for me it's about drawing and, and keeping, keeping drawing and, and playing with my colours and my watercolour palette. But, you know, just the other day when we were talking about the workshop you're doing, um, watercolour workshop, you said, you know, watercolours, you always need to start the watercolour from the top. And that for me is a, a foundation um, that I didn't know, I, you know, I, I never particularly know where I'm going to start my watercolour painting from. It's, um, and another foundation that I've seen through many of the art shows is um, painting your canvas, you know, this pink magenta colour. And, um, and there's, there's, I feel that there's lots of things, even though I did high school art, even though I've been, you know, dabbling for the last 20 years, I still see, think there's a whole vacuum there's a whole world of just the basic foundations that i still would love to learn and, and would um and, and are missing so what are some just a few that you can share with us um being the master that you are uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know you don't you don't believe your own publicity for a start <laughs> you know magazine you said that and i go yeah whatever you whatever you think um <laughs> I think that one of the things I've learned is I've, been, I've, and I've obviously met, you know, hundreds of professional artists right across the world, regardless of colour in your life. And I think the, the ones that where you can get into trouble and where you can be a very good artist and not get the recognition that you need is a thing called ego. And artists, like actors or rock and roll stars, particularly artists, for whatever reason, some of them can have very, very big egos. And in the end, I've seen artists literally shoot themselves in the foot because of their own egos and then get back to the old syndrome where nobody likes me, poor me, yada, yada. Mm. And they go, well, basically, you've sort of done this to yourself. Mm. Um, so I think that that is one of the foundations that you really have to check. And the, the thing that comes with the ego is the fact that um, you decrease your position on um, somebody teaching you how to do something. Your, your learning capacity decreases because of that. So straight away, it's sort of like, well, I'm better than everybody else. They have nothing to teach me. And I can look at people's work and go, oh, my God, you've got so much to learn. I have no idea. So that's, that's part and parcel of it as well. So, you know, nobody's that good. Don't believe in your own publicity for a start. You know, you just simply don't do that, regardless of what people say. It's like, oh, yeah, well, whatever, whatever you reckon. Um, and always be prepared to, to listen to constructive criticism. There are people that have destructive criticism and I sort of send, tend to slough them off. They're part of the percentage that I'm not interested in talking to and not interested in having them part of my life anyway. 
but the people that have constructive criticism, whether it's another artist as well, you know, whether you think that they're as good or better than you are. Uh, I mean, I always readily take advice from the masters that I know. It's like, oh, that's a good idea. And then that learning process helps you to establish the place for you to develop your, your career then. Um, you haven't been afraid to learn and that enables you to expand um, on the portfolio of knowledge that you have, which greatly increases your chances of meeting somebody that tells you the do's and don'ts, professional artists that, you know, are in a number of galleries and have their own galleries. You know, it's sort of like, you know, find a mentor if you can as well, which is what I did. It wasn't an art mentor by any means, but I did find a mentor. But if you can find somebody in the art world that is a mentor and then look at what they've done, you know, like I said, you don't have to reinvent the wheel at all. People have already done this. Um, and then look at their practice, look at how they go about it, what's their discipline, how long do they work, do they just sit in the studio and say nothing to anybody, or do they go to openings, do they introduce themselves to people, you know, are they at the right place to meet people that have money to purchase their work? All of those things come, in, come into play, and you can always tell the successful ones from the non-successful ones. It stands out of mind. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, Graham, so, and viewers, what we've done today we, is we've just started the conversation. And this is a conversation that leads on from our new e-zine. We've got a new, a new e-zine called Imagine that we'll be releasing every couple of months. It's free, of course, to meet premium members, but you can purchase online for $9.95. And the topic of that e-zine this month was the foundations or how to create a good art practice. And we invited uh, featured artists to, to tell us their um, impressions or their ideas. But now we're going to, the next step in this whole uh, process is the Ignite Mastermind Sessions. So we invite you to, to let me know uh, by this email address, natasha at colouringyourlife.com.au, that you want to join us next Wednesday at 10.30 a.m., Eastern Standard Time, which is Sydney time, if you're somewhere in the world trying to find out what time that is, daylight savings time. Australian, Australian time, yeah. Um, so 10.30 next Wednesday. And we're going to do a call similar to this, but we can, we can have any number of, of um, participants involved. Um, and this will be the beginning of a whole series of these Ignite Mastermind sessions where where we get experts in to share their ideas and information with, with other premium members. So if you haven't become a premium member, this is only for premium members. So you go to this website and you click on join and you've got lots of great benefits. Um, but we, we would really love to start this conversation with you and, and build our community of learning and sharing ideas amongst all our, our fabulous artists out there. So until, until next time, um, See you later, Graham. And uh, once again, let me know if you want to be involved. Uh, otherwise, just go to our website, colouringyourlife.com.au or follow us on Facebook, subscribe to our YouTube channel and we'll see you next time. See you later. Thanks, man. Bye now. Bye.